Hi, everyone. Welcome to the Self-Publishing Tips and Tricks Show, a series designed to give you insight into the world of self-publishing and marketing your books. I'm Shannon, writing under the pen name of SD Houston, and today I'm doing another off-season episode. Originally, I had a guest lined up to discuss a book, but the guest had to drop out. With only a small amount of time left, I decided to record the episode solo. Today, I will be discussing Angela Ackerman and Becca Plugisi's book, the Emotion Thesaurus, A Writer's Guide to Character Expression. But before I talk about the book, how it's helped me in my writing, and some of its limitations, I want to give some updates. My fantasy romance novel, A Curse of Scales and Feathers, is now with the editors. I have also hired a cover designer, so it's heading toward the final stages before I get ready to launch the book and hopefully put it up for ordering next month, so look out for that. We are also just over a month away from the free AuthorTube writing conference with more than 35 speakers. Our keynote speaker this year is Mark Leslie Lafave from Draft to Digital. We also have over $1,800 worth of giveaway prizes for those who attend and fill out feedback forms on the presentations. The giveaway prizes have been donated by several of the speakers, as well as some companies to include Scrivener, Story Origin, Plotter, Scribbler, and PseudoWrite. If you are interested in attending the conference and to see a full list of the giveaway prizes, you can find out more information on the website, authortubewritingconference.com. You can also find the link in the show notes. Last, during the conference, there will be a first page critique panel like last year. If you're interested in submitting your first page or roughly 250 words, you can anonymously submit through the form in the show notes or on the website. Now let's talk about today's book. The Emotion Thesaurus by Angela Ackerman and Becca Plugisi is a reference book for writers who want to improve their ability to convey characters' emotions effectively. I happen to own the paperback version of the first edition published in 2012, but they also have a second edition that came out in 2019. The newest edition has expanded to 55 new entries with new articles about dialogue, subtext, and more. And this is the book I will be referencing today. The main genre I have written in throughout my life is fantasy which is not always known for the strength of character development being more about the plot. So one of my weakest points in my writing were my characters. I learned to write fantasy from the fantasy books I read, but in time with more experience behind me, I realized that I wanted to develop my characters more. I wanted to get better at writing characters my readers could root for. This book, The Emotion Thesaurus, helped me in that endeavor with its comprehensive list of emotions. In the introduction, the authors say that dialogue has been a proven vehicle for expressing a character's thoughts, beliefs, and opinions, but nonverbal communication should be used too. This makes sense when researchers find that nonverbal communication accounts for 60 to 70% and sometimes even up to 93% of human communication. In the book, this nonverbal communication is broken into three elements, physical signals, internal sensations, and mental responses. A range of these nonverbal cues are found with each emotion entry, along with an explanation of what the emotion entails and other narrative techniques. The entries are alphabetically arranged with two pages devoted to each one. Each entry gives the definition of the emotion, followed by sections that include the following headings, physical signals and behaviors, internal sensations, mental responses, acute or long-term responses for this emotion, signs that this emotion is being suppressed, may escalate to, may de-escalate to, associated power verbs, and a writer's tip that's helpful but not necessarily a reference to that emotion. You can see some of these example emotions from the book listed on the author's website, One Stop for Writers. The website is a vast collection of reference materials that are intended to help writers improve their craft. Some of the information is freely available, but the majority of it is behind a subscription model paywall. They also have a free blog, Writers Helping Writers, which I find very helpful. All links can be found in the show notes. The emotion entries make up the majority of the book, but there are some guidance articles on avoiding common pitfalls, such as cliches, melodrama, and overuse of adverbs, as well as an article on subtext and the newest edition. Let's peek at one of the new entries added to the newest edition. Schadenfreude. When I saw this term, I had no idea what it was or how even to say it. I looked up how to pronounce it, though, so I would get it right here. Under Schadenfreude, the authors define it as malicious enjoyment from the suffering or unhappiness of others. 
This is followed by roughly 37 physical signals and behaviors, such as a sneer, followed by a bark of laughter, squinting from the force of one's grin, fingers that alternately flex and curl into fists, the face and neck flushing with pleasure, and more. Under internal sensations, they include things like a flush of warmth through the body, feeling lightheaded with adrenaline, an expansive feeling in the chest. Under mental responses, the examples are one's focus, narrowing on the victim, everything else fading away, fantasizing about participating in the victim's misfortune, feeling vindicated if one has been mistreated by the victim in the past, and more. Decreased empathy for people in general and wanting more and more extreme pain for the victim are a couple of examples under acute or long-term responses for this emotion. Decreased empathy for people in general and wanting more and more extreme pain for the victim are a couple of the examples under acute or long-term responses for this emotion. A smile that one tries and fails to restrain and making eye contact with the victim and shrugging with a smile are a couple of the signs that this emotion is being suppressed. Elation and hysteria are a couple of the emotions that this may escalate to, while guilt and shame are a couple of emotions that this may de-escalate to. Some of the associated power verbs include bash, bask, belittle, and cackle. All of this is really helpful, but after reading this entry, I want to know who or what inspired this information. With the thorough explanation of this emotion, I'm sure it was some awfully good research by the authors or the research that they found. I'm just amazed that this emotion is well known enough, meaning that there are people who feel this, to know what the physical cues and behaviors, along with the internal sensations, could be for someone who's experiencing this. It actually makes me just a bit afraid for humanity. This section ends with the writer's tip. When you're trying to write a specific character's emotional reaction to a situation, remember that their core personality traits, past experiences, and deepest fears will steer their actions. So all of the specific information accompanying each emotion entry is one of the book's strengths. It has an emphasis on showing and not telling, which is something that we hear so much as writers. When an emotion is named in writing, it is telling that emotion, like John is happy. The authors encourage writers to create an emotional experience for the reader rather than simply stating how a character feels. By providing specific and varied cues, the book helps writers create a more vivid and realistic portrayal of emotions. Let's review an example of telling an emotion and then showing it using guidance from the emotion thesaurus. Brandy was depressed and she looked out the window. Everyone laughed over Lisa's story. This is telling the reader that Brandy is sad for some reason. We are also told she's looking out the window and there are others near her. But how do these extra details relate to her depression or sadness? I can show this in revision by taking some of the cues from the emotion thesaurus. For example, I might use the phrases a vacant stare and choosing isolation from the physical signs section under the entry for depression and rewrite this to Brandy's vacant stare out the window isolated her from the others who laughed over Lisa's story. There are probably a dozen ways to revise this, like showing her isolation instead of saying it. But let's work with this and add more. Accompanying this entry in the book, the authors mention that sometimes it's not enough to show the emotion if a writer wants the readers to feel the emotions. And this can be done using visceral descriptions. There are sensations you might feel in your body when you experience the emotion. Using an example from the internal sensations section under this emotion in the thesaurus, I can add more. Brandy's vacant stare out the window isolated her from the others who laughed over Lisa's story. Her breathing became a shallow echo in the hollowness of her chest. This is just a quick example of how the book could be used to enhance writing emotions. It has been invaluable to me, and when I'm writing, this book sits next to me, almost touching my keyboard. I constantly refer to the entries, and I can say with a certainty that writing characters is no longer the weakest point of my writing. Now let's talk about some limitations. In my opinion, there are none other than it doesn't include every emotion one could think of. But realistically, that could take a lifetime to research and include. Without the work these authors have already done, I wouldn't have grown at developing my characters. So I'm grateful this book even exists. But there have been some that say while the authors provide numerous examples of how to convey emotions through dialogue and body language, they offer little guidance on how to incorporate emotions into the larger context of a scene or story. Personally, I don't think that was the intention of the book. Other writers have noted that the cues for some emotions are the same and may be too generic. They would prefer a more nuanced approach. The authors note that no two people are alike, and so how people feel and express their emotions can be different. 
It is up to the writer to shape their characters. The authors also suggest using the emotion thesaurus as a launching point as the entries are not designed to be a one-size-fits-all list of options. So what is the best tip or trick I've learned from Angela Ackerman and Becca Plugisi's book, The Emotion Thesaurus? The best trick I learned from this book is that each emotion not only has physical signals, but can also have mental responses. The mental responses listed for each entry surprised me. And by understanding how a character could react to certain emotions, helped me to develop my characters more and change them from having a flat character arc to either a positive or a negative character arc. If you've read this book, let me know what is the best tip or trick you learned from it. Overall, The Emotion Thesaurus is a valuable resource for writers looking to improve their ability to convey character emotions effectively. The book's emphasis on showing rather than telling, its comprehensive list of emotions and associated cues, and its clear organization make it a useful reference tool like any other reference books a writer might have. The book is widely available on all major platforms and retailers, and you'll find that the authors actually have a whole series of thesaurus books. I have many of these. My next favorite one that I use in planning my series is the Emotional Wound Thesaurus, a writer's guide to psychological trauma. And don't forget about the author's websites. You can find them on onestopforwriters.com and writershelpingwriters.net. Again, links can be found in the show notes. Thank you so much to our listeners and viewers for joining me today. We should be back with another off-season episode on June 15th, and I hope to see you then. Bye!